Please turn in your Bibles once again to the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 18. And here the Apostle Paul writes, as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him, and we're picking, in the, picking up in the middle of a sentence, I know, but this is how we're doing it today. <laughs> Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am, how I am and what I am doing Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. <clears throat> Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We've sung of your grace and your mercy today, and we rejoice in that. We know apart from your grace, we know apart for your love for us and what your son Jesus did for us, we would be hopelessly lost. Uh, as we think of the good news that we have heard and we have believed in about your son Jesus Christ, we think of those who communicated that to us. And uh, we talked about and maybe joked about beautiful feet earlier. Uh, but we think of your servant Paul, who out of, out of everyone, he is probably the most faithful of the evangelists of all time. And we look to his example here this morning. Please encourage us through this, motivate us through this, uh, help us to pray in light of what we see here, and do things in light of what we see from his example this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought or heard something like, why didn't God just give us a book with 30 things, maybe 50 things that he wants us to do, and then just be done with it? Why, why a whole Bible like this? You know, just boil it down. And give us the 30 hot takes or the 50 hot takes. You know, just leave it with that. I guess that's something we'll have to ask him in heaven someday when we see him. But I wonder if the reason is something like this. We are image bearers of God, not robots. And as such, there are different ways that we learn, that we are motivated, that we do. For instance, we learn by example. I, th I think you would say the same for yourself. Uh, when I was growing up, and uh, this was in the days of Michael Jordan when he was in college, but not yet a pro, so I didn't know him very well. Uh, but there was a basketball player by the name of Albert King. Has anyone heard of Albert King? Didn't think so. He's not that famous. Not like Michael Jordan. Have you, has anyone heard of Michael Jordan? <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> and um, Albert King, he he played for University of Maryland, and at the time they were not in the Big Ten, and we weren't in the Big Ten. Nebraska wasn't. And then he went to uh, the New Jersey Nets to play basketball for them. And the thing I liked about Albert King was he wasn't real tall. And he had a great shot, but, but his shot, and this is what I tried to imitate, I'd go out in the driveway after watching him play, sometimes even when there's snow on the ground out there, and try imitating his shot. His shot, I don't know if I can do it with my suit on, but he had his arms way up like this as he shot and would release way up high. So even though he's only 6'6", <laughs> for, for a pro that's not that tall. He was only 6'6", but it was hard to block his shot because he had that very high release that he had. So uh, I'd go out and try to imitate that. And I never could quite shoot like that. 
But uh, did he tell me to do that? No, he doesn't even know who I, who I was. Did anyone tell me to do that? No, no one told me to do that. I admired what he was doing and just went out to do it on my own because there's this example, there's someone who I admired, I thought he had a great shot, so I just went out and tried to do it. Power of example. Of course, we also learn by being told what to do and how to do it. But biblically, and when we talk not about basketball, but about our spiritual lives, we also see that because of sin entering into the world, and even as believers, the Bible brings out there is still a battle with our flesh. So biblically, it's not just a matter of being told the right thing to do and we're all going to go out and do it. But also, yes, that's super important that that happens. But also we need God in his grace and through the Holy Spirit to empower us and to help us to do what God calls us to do. And maybe you're thinking, okay, so what? What's this have to do with Ephesians and here at the end of this letter? Uh, I, I take it what the connection is is this. Here at the end of the letter to Ephesians, we see all these different things come together. We don't just have commands. Uh, in a sense, we have one command to pray for Paul. Uh, but we do have example. And in Paul's example, we see a man who doesn't just go out and grind it out every day and just, you know, he's this superhuman effort that he had. He acknowledges, I'm in need of God to help me to do this. Pray for me as well. Paul needed God's empowerment just like we all do. Here at the end of this tremendous letter, we see four items from an apostle in chains so that we would be built up and encouraged in the midst of a hostile world. His world was very, very hostile. Our world is growing where we live, I should say, is growing increasingly hostile to the gospel. Today we're just going to look at two of these. I always have good intentions as I start off in the week and study for things, but then it comes to it. Just two things. Next week we'll finish off, Lord willing, the four items. Okay, so, but here, here they are. Here's what we will be looking at between this week and, Lord willing, next week. Uh, prayer requests from Paul. Personal updates about Paul from Tychicus. Peace and love to the brothers. Isn't that, I, I, that fits so well with our time. Peace and love. That's what Paul was talking about. And then prayer for grace for those who love. Again, we'll see only the first two of these items this morning. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the last two. Uh, please look down your Bibles to Ephesians 6, verse 18. These items are found in verse 19 through the end of the chapter. But to start us off again, verse 18. Uh, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And here's where we get into t today's message, verse 19. And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We saw last week uh, that a huge part of our resources in the midst of spiritual warfare involve prayer. And especially that we're all soldiers of Christ and we're all in this battle together and it takes all of us praying for one another. That's, that's a big part of our resources in the midst of spiritual warfare that we're all praying for each other. We, we each, in a sense, have each other's back. End of verse 18, again, making supplication for all the saints. Here in verses 19 and 20, Paul reminds his readers that this includes me too. I, I'm one of these saints. I need some prayer too. It's, if you're thinking I'm beyond that, no, no, I'm not. I need your prayers, and here's a couple of requests I have for you to be praying for me, Paul says. And, and before we look at those requests, I, I would just like you first to note the implication of this. Think of the Apostle Paul and what we know about him. I, I think what I would describe him as 
even before God saved him, he was a, a go-getter. He was a naturally a bold person. He was very smart. But then after he was saved, in addition to those natural qualities that he had, uh, after he was saved, saved, Paul literally, actually this is what saved him, he, he saw a vision of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Uh, after he was saved, there are numerous times where Jesus would communicate with Paul from heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul even says this about himself. Uh, first item, prayer request from Paul, that's where we're at. But 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4, he says, he refers to himself in the third person, but this is talking about Paul. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago is caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Uh, Paul has all this going for him. He'd seen these visions. He'd, he'd even seen what heaven is like. He is caught up to the third heaven as he writes this letter. If a man with all these things going for him, a man who had been caught up into paradise, if he needs prayer, what does that mean for you and I? Yes, we all definitely need prayer and others praying for us as well. None of us are far enough advanced in our Christian walk that we are beyond the need of prayer. That's, I, I take it, an implication of what we see here from Paul's example here. Pray for me too. I need it too. So what does Paul request for himself? Look down to verse 19 again. Ephesians 6, verse 19. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. First, he requests that words may be given to me. Now, without getting too deep into this subject, and I don't know if you're even thinking about this, I'm going to plant an idea in your mind that shouldn't be there to start with, but uh, if you're wondering, well, is this just like direct revelation that he's talking about? Is this something, since he's an apostle, he could ask for this, but it doesn't fit for what we would ask for ourselves? Again, you probably weren't even thinking about that, but... Uh, my answer to that is, no, I, I don't think it's that. Uh, I agree with Peter O'Brien when he says the apostle is not implying that a particular supernatural utterance be placed in his mouth. He's just asking people that they would pray for him, that God would give him the right words and in the right manner as he proclaims the mystery of the gospel. In other words, this is something... Uh, something we can be praying for one another as well. We'll get into more, more into that in a moment. Now, I wouldn't have thought about this just reading through the passage, but also there are some Bible scholars, and in studying for this passage, some Bible scholars would say, when Paul is asking for prayer like this, he's, he's speaking specifically about the fact that he will be facing a trial before the Roman emperor Nero. Uh, and, and that's what he's thinking about as he asks for a request like this. Could be that. Could be that. But turn over to Colossians. And Colossians is the sister epistle, I like to call it. Others do too. Sister epistle of Ephesians. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. If you were here at the start of your our study in Ephesians, you recall, and probably many of you have studied Ephesians anyhow, and you know this, but Colossians and Ephesians were written during Paul's uh, imprisonment. He's under house arrest while he's in Rome. And I take it that both were written at about exactly the same time. It's just Colossians was specifically directed to Colossae, while Ephesians was a circular letter. We'll see in a little bit that Tychicus took both these letters out to these churches. Page 985 in the Pew Bibles, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. So I'm saying all that to say when we see something in Colossians and what it says there, it can help us to understand a little bit more of what's being said in Ephesians. 
Colossians 4, verse 2. Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. That's that same basic idea we've just seen in Ephesians in spiritual warfare uh, that we've just been looking at. But then verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Very similar ideas here as there are in Ephesians. But in Colossians, what, why I wanted you to look at this, he requests that God may open to open to us a door for the word. Okay, what's that mean? I, I take it just in general. While he's under house arrest, and that is, as he's writing Colossians, he's under house arrest. In general, he's saying, God, somehow, even while I'm here under house arrest, open a door, even while I'm here. Maybe there's somehow, some way where I can still be proclaiming the gospel. Give me opportunities, even when I can't be out and about like I'd like to be. I think he's just asking in general. Not specifically for something about Nero, but in general, I think that's his focus. I just want to have opportunities to proclaim the gospel. Uh, I take it then that Ephesians is talking just in general uh, of opportunities whenever he has them to proclaim the gospel, that when he has those opportunities, God would give him the right words to speak. And yes, to this, I, what I'm saying, I think it's broad enough to include being before Caesar, before Nero, but overall it's just kind of a broad statement here. Here's one way that I take it, God answered a prayer like that uh, from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul writes, I want you, and, and he's still under house arrest as he's writing Philippians. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So how would the whole Roman guard find out about it, that his imprisonment was because of Christ? Because as they're guarding Paul, he told them this was his opportunity. He's, you could say, a captive audience. They thought they were keeping him captive. Uh, they were his captive audience while they were there guarding him. And he'd tell them, here's why I'm under arrest. It's because of Jesus Christ. And here's who Jesus Christ is. And here's what he did for you. And here's uh, how he rose from the dead. And all these things. And as he proclaimed it to them, verse 13 says, it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So I, I take it God answered those prayers for open doors. I take it that God also answered his prayer in Ephesians for boldness and to give the right words. For you and for me, this is something that we can pray for one another. First, that God may open a door to us for the word. That's Colossians. But second, based on Ephesians chapter 6, that words might be given to us as we take the opportunities that God gives. The content of the gospel, the essentials of who Christ is and what he did for us, that will always stay the same. The content, the heart of the gospel will always stay the same. But when we ask for things like Paul did, I take it uh, while we're sharing with different individuals, we want God to give us just the right words for the unique situation that we're in. Uh, Steve shared this earlier, so I'll put a plug in for Steve Hughes, our church evangelist at this time. Day in and day out, he is involved in cold call evangelistic efforts. I don't know if you know what cold call means. It's, it means this is not with friends and neighbors and coworkers. These are people who he oftentimes has never met before. And in those situations and times I've been with them, and for those of you who've been with them, you've seen this too, there are a huge amount of situations and conversations that he gets into. I, I think I can guarantee, 
Can, can you say, I think I guarantee, or is it that those go against each other? I'll just say this. I guarantee you, and I'll look at Steve and wait for an amen, that he would be thrilled with these kind of prayers regularly going up for him as he seeks to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Is that an amen, Steve? Amen. Okay. That words, so the first request I'm talking about right now, that words would be given to him as he's out there sharing the gospel. Uh, but, but again, it's not just something for Steve. It's for me. It's for you. It's for those times, for any of us, when we go through that open door that God gives and we're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, please, please give me the right words here. The, situa- the gospel, again, that always stays the same, but in conversation, there's so many different ways things can go and so many unique situations. God, just give me the right words as I'm trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's the first request, that words might be given to him. Second request, uh, if you're not there, turn back to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 20. Page 979 in the Pew Bible. Second request. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Here in verse 20 of Ephesians 6, Paul uses a verb in the original languages. It's just one verb. In English, it's translated as declare it boldly. That's one word in the original languages. In verse 19, he used the noun form of the same Greek word where he said, in opening my mouth boldly, just that word boldly is the noun form of this same word that he used in verse 20. Boldly. I, I think we all get a sense of what that is without hearing what I'm going to say, but Bible scholar Harold Honer notes on this Greek verb, declare it boldly. It has the same basic meaning as the noun, parasia. That was in verse 19. Denoting freedom to speak with no restraints, hence to speak freely, boldly, fearlessly, or openly. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in situations where because of who you're around, you're like, ah, I better not say anything. Uh, that's the opposite of speaking boldly. And what Paul is saying, pray for me that I might speak freely, boldly, no restraints, fearlessly, not rudely. I think you all know from reading Scripture, yeah, that doesn't mean being rude about things. But if things need to be said, and it's true, and you're speaking the truth in love, God, help me to say it. Give me the right words, and then help me to be bold about it and speak freely about it without restraints. Even if it's in front of Nero, help me to be like this. Again, I love the fact that who's the one making this request? Paul. He's seen all that he has. He's experienced all that he has. He's, he's been in the midst of mob riots. He's, been, uh, he's gone through beatings. And, and you, you'd think he's just the most bold guy in the world. And yet here he is. Pray for me. Pray for me that I might declare this message boldly. If, if you've ever thought, well, Paul, of course, did what he did. He's this unique person. He's Paul. Of course he's going to be like that. He is naturally fearless. What we see here, even for Paul, it was necessary for God to help him to declare these things boldly. Again, if if that's true for Paul, what does that mean for us? We need it. If he needs it, we really need it. Uh, But if in evangelism or sharing the gospel or proclaiming Christ, if there's ever fear uh, that's keeping you from sharing the gospel... Don't, don't just stop with that. Acknowledge the fear that you have and maybe think through some reasons you might be fearful. But after that, step one should be to pray to our Father in heaven, help me to declare this with boldness. Not just think, I could never share the gospel with anyone. Maybe naturally you never could. But like this, God, help me to do it. Help me to do it. Help me to proclaim the gospel and help me to do it boldly. And remember the promise uh, from Philippians, I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me. I can do it if God helps me. If God makes me bold, I can do it. Some believe that one of the greatest recorded evangelistic messages of the Apostle Paul was when he stood on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17 and proclaimed the gospel. It was powerful. It was ingenious. He, he had the right words for this situation. People he's meeting with there, all these pagans on Mars Hill. Uh, you know how that ended? Acts 17, verse 32. Now, this is after this great message of Paul, and we look at it and analyze it, and it, it's, very, it, it's a great message to analyze and seek to emulate. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. Some mocked. It was a tremendous message. There wasn't anything wrong with what he said. The right words were given to Paul. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit as he was speaking. But yet, when it was all said and done, some mocked. Now, for Paul, I, I, who knows why he's requesting boldness exactly. I mean, he was beaten and all the kind of things that he went through that we probably, probably in this room, no one has gone through for sharing the gospel. We don't know about the future, what that might hold. But up to this point, I don't think any of us have been physically persecuted for sharing the gospel. But for us, maybe our concern is some mocked. That's something that you or I may very well face. The message meets with mockery. Think in our culture today, maybe 40 years ago, there might have been a general cons consensus about Jesus and his resurrection, but not today. So for us, again, when we're talking about this idea of boldness and pray for me for boldness, how much of what you say or you don't say as a Christian may be out of fear of being mocked? Well, again, from Paul's example here, if, if that's a reason for fear, pray for boldness despite fear. Pray for the freedom of speech to say what you believe, what Scripture teaches, no matter what our society says. This is true. Whether you mock it or not, this is true. And you speak the truth in love. So we, we've seen these two prayer requests from Paul. Next we see... Uh, personal updates about Paul from Tychicus. And I didn't plan on saying this, but do you, does, does anyone know what, if Chan was in here, I'm sure he would, but does anyone know what the word, the name Tychicus means? Lucky. <laughs> so it's like when you're saying Tychicus, hey, Lucky, come here. Okay, look down to Ephesians 6, verse 20. I'm sure that was given to him by pagan parents. So he didn't have any choice in the matter, but uh, that's, that's Tychicus. Ephesians 6, verse 21. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Apparently, Tychicus was the man who brought Paul's circular letter of Ephesians to the different churches that that letter went to, as well as uh, the letter to Colossians. He took the letter from Paul to the Colossians. Uh, here's what Paul says in Colossians about him. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. We know from ancient history, and we see this brought out in Proverbs, how important the job of the messenger was. Proverbs 25 verse 13 says, Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his master's. So selecting someone to deliver your letter like this, Ephesians and Colossians, selecting the one who's going to take that letter, it's very important. It'd be a big deal in the day when you couldn't just email someone or uh, going back a few years, just putting a stamp on a, on a letter and putting it in the mailbox. Okay, they're going to get it. 
No, in this day, they didn't have the mailbox. They definitely didn't have email. So you had to have a, a faithful messenger like Tychicus who you can trust with this all-important letter to get it there. That's him. So what do we know about Lucky? I'm just calling him that a time or two just to wake you up a little bit. In Acts 20, verse 4, we read of a group of men who were accompanying Paul to Jerusalem with his gift from the Gentile churches uh, to the church at Jerusalem. Acts 20, verse 4, it says this, So Peter the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. So he was... From this area. He is from uh, Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. This was about in 59 AD when he did this. And, and we find him still at Paul's side as Paul now is writing under house arrest in Rome. This is about 61 AD when Paul is writing this. Think of all that Paul had gone through since he first went to Jerusalem and all these trials and the persecution and all the dangers. And here, here Tychicus, I, I don't know if he came and went or what, but he started on that trip. And here Paul's in Rome under house arrest and here Tychicus is with him again. Tychicus stood with him through these hard times. Finally, at the very end of Paul's life, I take it in this imprisonment, Paul would not die. He was released. He was able to share the gospel again and go out again. But then he had another imprisonment, about 67 AD, and he would die in that imprisonment. Uh, we see Tychicus still there. 2 Timothy 4, verse 12, Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. And Titus 3, 12, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. So just over this period of years, we, we keep seeing, and, and he's not very famous at all. Maybe many of you haven't heard of Lucky before. Uh, but, but here he is. He's with Paul through all these things, faithfully representing Paul on these different missions. This fits with the description that Paul gives him in Ephesians 6, verse 21. Look down there. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. First, he's a beloved brother. Uh, beloved, certainly that's a term of affection. And brother, that's a term of affection too. But it's, it's also something that's true for each one of us who've been born again. Uh, we won't get to it this morning, but look down to verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 6. Peace be to the brothers. And if you look in your little footnotes, it always says, and it's right to say it, that this includes women as well, the, the brethren, the brothers and the sisters. This is what all of us are as believers in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. Uh, we're familiar with this terminology. It might be easy to pass over this. But th this is a supernatural family. And I don't remember who it was who said it, I think. I don't even want to say a name. I think it was someone who's preaching on Sunday night. But uh, when we get together on Sunday mornings, it's like a family reunion because brothers and sisters, that, that's us. We're brothers and sisters because we all have the same father and we've all been adopted into his family because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So this, this is great. This is a relationship that is more important than even your physical brothers and sisters because this relationship will go on forever. So remember that. And our, our, our church isn't about your... Uh, job or your class or your color or whatever ways that the world tries to divide us apart. The church is about we're brothers and sisters because we all have the same father. Okay. He's the beloved brother. Second, he's a faithful minister. Key word there, faithful. All these things, I was going through those verses because all these situations in Paul's life, Tychicus was with him. You'd think if, if, if you're going to abandon someone, it'd be when they're arrested, and let alone get arrested twice. 
Uh, Tychicus was with him in his first Roman imprisonment. He was with him in his second Roman imprisonment. He was with him when he went to Jerusalem. All these things. This is just a faithful man. He's going to stick it out. He's going to be with Paul. He was a faithful minister. How about us? Would we be characterized as faithful? Uh, one example, something that God has entrusted to each one of us uh, is found in 1 Peter 4. Why don't you turn over there, 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 10. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. This is on page 1016 in your pew Bibles. And here Peter writes, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's varied grace. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been given a gift. And it's great to receive a gift. We think of the gift of eternal life. This verse is talking about spiritual gifts. You've been given a a spiritual gift. And and then Peter uh, has to throw, throw throw in the knife a little bit after that. Now you've received it. Now as good stewards, use it. In other words, be faithful in using what God, and this isn't just for preachers or evangelists or whoever, everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ, you've received a spiritual gift. Now use it and be a good steward. Tychicus is a great example for all of us. He's faithful in whatever God called him to do. He was going to do it. He's going to be using his gifts and being with Paul. Uh, we're called to be good stewards, faithful in using how what God has given to us. And remember, it was Paul who, who wrote this. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. So that, that's important for us to consider as well. well. Will we be found faithful with what God has entrusted us? Look down to Ephesians 6 verse 22. Ephesians 6, verse 22. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, Tychicus, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So in Ephesians, Paul's gone over doctrinal issues. He's gone over practical issues. Here's how you should live in light of uh, what, who you are as believers, what God has done for you as believers. But here in areas like, how am I doing? Like, uh, I'm talking about Paul. Uh, do I get any sleep at night? Is it cold? Do, do I need more food? You know, things like this. Okay, Tychicus, he's going to come, and you can ask all those kind of questions to him. I know you're wondering about, here I am under house arrest. How is Paul doing, though? What's going on in his life? What's, what's the name of the guy who's guarding him, and how can we pray for him? All these kind of things. Well, that's what Tychicus is coming to share the very practical things. How's Paul doing? You know, what's going on with him? He he sends them that you may know how we are. But note what else is Paul's concern. I'm sending Tychicus that he may encourage your hearts. You know, here... Paul is the one who is facing a trial before Caesar, before Nero. Paul's the one under house arrest. And he's thinking, well, I want you to be encouraged. And I'm saying Tychicus to encourage your hearts. This is, I guess, that example, again, that we think of with Paul. What an example. He, even as he's, he faces death, he, it's not an easy time being under house arrest for him. And, and he's concerned about them. Well, how are you guys doing? Well, I'm going to send Tychicus to make sure he can encourage your hearts through all this. Encouraging their hearts. In the sister letter of Colossians, look what he says there, what, what he did. Paul, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Paul is saying here, I'm agonizing over this. I'm struggling for this. 
I, I'm praying for this, that your hearts may be encouraged. And one scholar puts it, what, what he's saying in Colossians, the word for encouragement, he says, this is the encouragement afforded by the presence of a staunch friend upon whom one can rely. That's if you can get an idea of what that would look like. That's what Paul's praying for them. I don't know if you ever wonder, uh, does God care if I'm encouraged or discouraged? Does God care what's going on in my heart in the sense of being down because maybe I feel all alone or abandoned? I take it here in Ephesians and Colossians with the emphasis that Paul puts in this area of, okay, I, I want your hearts to be encouraged. I'm wrestling in prayer about this. I'm sending Tychicus so that you may know how I'm doing, so that your hearts may be encouraged. Answer that question, does God care if I'm encouraged or not? He cares. He cares. God wants you to be encouraged. Encouragement like that comes through knowing and trusting in Jesus' promise. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's always with us. We always have Jesus. There's that friend if you're ever feeling discouraged. Everyone's abandoned me. Jesus is always with you as a believer. He gives the tremendous promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. But uh, just practically encouragement, how that happens, uh, an avenue of how that can happen, is through others' prayers for us, to that end. Again, you see it in Colossians 2, verse 1. Paul is saying, I was agonizing, I was struggling over these kind of prayers for you, that you would be encouraged in your hearts. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'll beat it a little bit more from last week. When we're talking about praying for others, as we did last week, this is something, Colossians 2, verse 2, that... Paul agonized in prayer for others. This is something, and you don't know what's, what's going on in someone's lives all the time. Some people you might know everything going on, but a lot of people you don't. But you could still sure be praying for people like Paul did, uh, that their hearts might be encouraged. God, please do that in their hearts. I don't know what they're facing, but please grant them encouragement in their hearts. And by the way, uh, with our prayer calendar, that is a verse about praying for others that's not on there. So if you want to add that one, that'd be a good one to be praying for others also. He talks about here also in Colossians about encouragement. He, I, I take it he fills out how that encouragement happens further. He says, being knit together in love. And I take it it's, that's with other believers. So... If you're looking for encouragement, that, that's something very practically you can ask yourself, okay, am I knit together in love with any other believers? Is there that tight connection? Because this is part of how this encouragement happens. This is part of how encouragement in the heart happens. Being knit together in love. Having those connections. If you don't think you have that, Maybe begin serving in a ministry with other people or join a life group or join a Bible study or just give someone who you know that's another believer a call. Invite them over for a coffee or if you're like me who doesn't like coffee, a Coke. Uh, but begin making connections like this. There's a reason that Paul describes the church as a body. We need each other. Relationships. Prayers from others, prayers for others, service together with others. And we see from Paul's sending of Tychicus here that even just good words from someone else. Okay, Tychicus, Tychicus is going to come. He's going to tell you how I am. So your hearts are encouraged. So even just hearing good news sometimes, just good words from another believer, that encourages hearts as well. As a body, let's be using all these means for our encouragement and for others' encouragement as well. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these examples of faithfulness from men, certainly like the Apostle Paul. 
and maybe a, a man we haven't heard of or thought much of, Tychicus, a beloved brother, a faithful minister. As we look to them, I, I think almost everyone in this room would admire them and say, yeah, I'd like to be like that. Through your Holy Spirit, we'd ask, help us to be like them as they are like your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be prayerful for others. Help us to be knowing how dependent we are on you to strengthen us and empower us, even for such things as getting the right words out, and even for boldness. Help us as a body in this way, Father, we ask. And, Lord, you know the hearts of everyone here. Uh, maybe there's uh, lots of people who would say, I need some encouragement in my heart. Well, as Paul prayed for the Colossians, and as we see his heart was for the Ephesians and all who'd received this letter, uh, please, Father, be encouraging the hearts of all those who are your children in this room. Lord, if whatever that takes, be an encouragement to them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.